This is CBC Here and Now. Welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. Premier Dwight Ball is still trying to manage the damage. He's in Labrador tonight meeting with members of the Innu Nation. This after former cabinet minister MHA Perry Trimper left controversial comments in an accidental voicemail message. Comments that the Innu Nation describe as racist. Here now is Jacob Barker is covering the political fallout today. So Jacob, what is the latest? Well, Anthony, I can tell you that I've seen the premier come and go more than once uh, from this room, and it's actually the second round of discussions that they've had here. And uh, the talks are still ongoing, is the message I hear uh, from uh, both the premier side and the Innu Nation. But just down the road from here earlier today, there was a, a group of uh, residents here, along with uh, people from uh, Sheshashi and Natwashish, that gathered and uh, made their feelings about what uh, Minister, or sorry, MHA Trimper should do. <laughs> Trimper, Trimper, Trimper! Out, out, out. And we don't believe that we should be living like it's 1919. And we believe that Aboriginal languages on a motor vehicle document is not too much to ask for or expect. And respect for people who want that is not too much to ask for. Uh, Perry Trimper has uh, proven his true colors to the people of Labrador, in particular to the district of Lake Melville. And we have had enough. And if racism is going to end in our time, it's got to start somewhere. And we cannot have leaders with racist, biased views. It strikes everybody. It doesn't just strike one, one culture. He's stepped down from his ministership. Is that enough? Well, that's part one. The other part two is coming, I guess. He's out, it's, it's totally in his hands. But I don't know how to look at it now since the report came out last week, how I would justify to be in the same working environment as him. Do you support the, the, the call for, for resignation? I think that's a decision that Trimper has to make for himself. Right now, the community is asking for, for that. And, and my opinion is that you know, you got to make amends, and you got to give someone an opportunity to make amends. I thought we were his friends, like personal friends. We always talk when he, whenever we met him. I thought I, I feel very betrayed mm -hmm. and hurt for him to be saying that stuff. Well, Anthony, I can tell you this meeting originally, they told me it was supposed to only be an hour long, but they certainly are hashing through the issues and trying to come uh, towards some sort of agreement. Uh, it's gone on for uh, over four hours now, so they certainly are working through the issues. And as soon as we find out uh, what happened and what was said inside that room, we'll have the latest for you. Reporting live for Here and Now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. And of course, uh, we'll have more on that meeting and check out our website later, cbc.ca slash nl. Now to Memorial University, where the belt tightening is continuing. Millions in salary spending has been cut through an attrition program, as well as some early retirement incentives. New collective agreements have also helped hold the line on costs. And now, senior management positions are in the crosshairs. Terry Roberts reports. An independent review has found that many senior management salaries here at MUN are significantly higher than the national average. Now, because of that, any new hires can expect to be paid thousands less than their predecessors. While a number of our positions were below the uh, average salaries, there were a substantial number that were above. Uh, some of those ranged, say, in the, between 15 and 20 percent above the national average, which is what we're aiming to be at. So MUN has adopted a new salary scale for its more than 100 managers, many of them located right here in the Arts and Administration building. In one case, a position paying 190,000 slashed by 20 grand. Now, if you currently occupy that position, you won't feel any financial pain. We're going to honor uh, the, the contractual commitments that have been made to the individuals that are currently in the organization. However, for every new person that comes into the organization in these groups, we will be uh, offering them positions on the new salary scales, and that has already started. And generally, those are lower salary scales, would you? They're generally lower. Salaries reduced by 15, 20 percent. So how did this misalignment happen? Mon has linked its salary increases to public sector bargaining, and Dodge says that meant some big bumps in the early part of the past decade. That contributed a lot to, I think, us outpacing the national market, which is really unusual for Newfoundland and Labrador, which we usually find we're below uh, on an annual basis the market. 
Now this is just the latest hit to this group. Roughly 30 managerial positions have been cut in recent years as Mon grapples with a reduced operating grant from government and a long-standing tuition fee freeze for local students that limits the university's ability to offset those cuts. When it's all said and done, Mon expects to save $1.5 million in salary costs. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, shifting from universities to the public system, it's an experiment that sounds like many a young teenager's dream. Let's see what happens when junior high school students don't have to write final exams. Well, it's a pilot project, but it could influence how the English school district assesses students in the future. Cecil Hare now with that story. Right now, students in grades 7 through 9 write final exams in three subjects, math, science, and English. But what about all the effort that goes into those finals? The school board wants to see if it's worth it. They take up a significant amount of time at the end of the year. Um, there's a lot of review required. That's great instructional time that we're losing for something that we wonder how accurate it is and how representative is it of actual student learning. Stack says memorization and regurgitation is an old-fashioned way to assess students' progress and is falling to the wayside. This province, he adds, is one of the few in Canada that still has grade 7 and 8 students write final exams. With this pilot project, students will instead be evaluated throughout the school year. On the sidewalk outside McDonald Drive Junior High, these grade 7s have mixed emotions. Well, I think it's good because that it gives us more time to warm up to the matter, but I also think that education is very important, so I'm kind of uh, mixed fields. I think that it's great because <laughs> I just love not having to take any tests. It sounds okay, but like having a lot more work would also be a little bit annoying, but uh, I, I don't really have an opinion on it. Because like 50% of our grades, so if I just study a lot then, it's like in 50%, so I don't like the new not exams thing. The pilot project kicks off this school year and will run until 2022. Participation isn't mandatory. Schools can opt in or out anytime. Cease here, CBC News, St. John's. Trevor was my uh, my best friend, and uh, you know when uh, when we lost him, it was a tremendous loss to uh, to us. Many people walked on the weekend to remember Trevor O'Keefe, a much loved and well respected police officer. Their aim was to help people understand more about the effects of post traumatic stress disorder. That story in just a few minutes. What a lovely day as far as temperatures go across the island. Anyway, in the high teens, Gander hit 19 degrees, Cornerbrook 18. And uh, we do have those temperatures in the single digits for most of uh, Labrador and 8 degrees for Cartwright uh, as your afternoon high. Now we are seeing some showers move across. Plenty of cloud cover as well for most of the island. Uh, you can see that uh, rotation. We do have a low pressure system in play tonight. More rain on the way and a little bit of a cool down. We'll have all the details coming up. An RNC officer who has been suspended, an RNC officer has been suspended since 2015, wants to start getting paid again. Doug Snellgrove's sexual assault retrial is set for next year, but his lawyer says it's unreasonable to be suspended without pay for such a long period of time. Snellgrove's charges stem from a 2014 incident when he was on duty. A woman asked the uniform officer for a ride home. Snellgrove claims the two had consensual sex at her apartment, but the woman says she was too intoxicated to give consent. No word yet on when the judge is expected to make a ruling about Snellgrove's pay. A young woman paralyzed as a result of dangerous driving gave a powerful statement in Supreme Court today about how life has changed for her as well as her family in the years since the crash. The court also heard from Joshua Steele Young, the man who was driving the car and was convicted earlier this summer of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. 24-year-old Morgan Party suffered a spinal cord injury in the crash that has left her unable to walk. She was ejected from a car going well over the speed limit in a snowstorm. Just minutes earlier, she says she took off her seatbelt and asked to be let out of the car. In an emotional victim impact statement, Party talked about the ongoing hardship it has caused her. Weeping, she talked about her anxiety and depression. 
how she feels guilty that her mother must care for her like an infant. During most of Party's statement, Steele Young hung his head low, his elbows resting on his thighs. In court, he also gave a statement. He said he didn't want to harm Party that day, and he's truly sorry for what happened to her. Lawyer Randy Piercy, who represents Steele Young, says previous cases suggest a four- to six-month sentence would be appropriate. Party's lawyer disagreed, saying you can't overstate the impact this has had on her client. Instead, lawyer Jennifer Lundergan suggested three to three and a half years would be an appropriate sentence for Steele Young. The judge is scheduled to make her sentencing decision in early October. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Over the weekend, walks were held in St. John's and Clarenville to remember an RCMP officer who took his own life. In the two years since Corporal Trevor O'Keefe's suicide, talking about the mental health of first responders has become somewhat less of a taboo. But friends and family of Trevor O'Keefe say it's important to keep talking. This is the third annual uh, Walk a Mile in His Shoes in memory of Corporal Trevor O'Keefe. Trevor was my, uh, my best friend and uh, you know when, uh, when we lost him it was a tremendous loss to, uh, to us. Certainly you know, Trevor's situation is not unique to first responders. Uh, these are you know, tough, tough jobs, tough occupations and we need to keep talking about it. Sometimes the public don't realize how much stuff we're actually physically and mentally uh, under. You know, I, you know, know through conversations I have with Trevor over the years, the, the challenges that first responders face and uh, it's not an easy job by any stretch of the imagination. It's like everything, everything I think there could be more changes, right? You know, there's more and more organizations that are reaching out, connecting, and trying to come together. There's a much greater recognition that, you know, that these are tough jobs and that we shouldn't expect people to come to work and, and you know, the things that we ask them to see and do, it's just not natural. And, uh, you know, while we can control many things, there, you know, uh, some of the stuff that uh, our officers have to respond to, we can't control. And so we got to try to better prepare them, you know, to, for what they're going to have to see, do, and, uh, and be involved with and afterwards to make sure that we're there to support them uh, after the event. It was a sad day for many ball players in Cornerbrook today. An old clubhouse has been around since the 1940s was torn down. A back end loader moved in this morning and started knocking down the brick clubhouse at Jubilee Field. The spot has been a gathering place for baseball players for generations, but the exterior was dilapidated with rotting wood and crumbling concrete and its showers haven't worked in decades. The building was demolished to make way for a new $1.8 million structure. Construction of the new clubhouse is expected to start in the coming weeks. Well, it's the tail end of 2019, and that means a new Murbys calendar. I didn't have any expectations that the first calendar was going to go beyond selling maybe a few hundred. So the fact that here we are two years later, having sold tens of thousands, um, over the last couple of years. No, I can't believe it, but here we are. Different year, same vision. <laughs> the Newfoundland Labrador Beard and Mustache Club launched its latest calendar over the weekend. The goal, of, uh, the goal, of course, if you remember from last year, was to dismantle toxic masculinity as well as to raise money for some inclusive causes. Copies of the calendar featured colorful bearded mermen in scenic spots around the island. 2018 and 2019 editions raised more than half a million dollars for charity. Proceeds will mainly go to Planned Parenthood and the Sexual Health Centre, the Home Again Furniture Bank and the St. John's SPCA. It was a congested weekend, but at the end of the day, you know, this is a project that could have taken four to six weeks with continual delay for commuters. So, you know, uh, I guess it was a, it was a short-term pain, but what would be a long-term gain if, uh, if we had to reduce the highway for four to six weeks? Now this giant culvert is the reason, the culvert culprit, is the reason drivers on the Trans-Canada are reporting delays of up to three hours. But just ahead, some good news for those of you who are heading that way in the near future.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, the highway construction project near Avondale that has caused headaches for thousands of drivers is almost complete. On the weekend, it was bumper to bumper traffic as drivers faced a two and a half hour detour through Avondale. But while there was plenty of frustration, one local business owner says there were some perks too. We have never seen such traffic, such an inflow of traffic in this area, and we'll never see it again, all of this traffic. So uh, it's been a little surreal for us to watch all the, the trucks maneuver around the turns and whatever. I picked up probably a few extra uh, customers because of it, so <laughs> it doesn't, that way it doesn't hurt me, you know. We are definitely downtown Avondale. <laughs> Booming downtown. We are booming downtown <laughs> Avondale now in the past since Friday, I have to say. And uh, the flag people there have been doing a good job. And it seems like people have been pretty patient, even though a lot of people have no idea where they're going right now. And it was amazing to see all the traffic coming and just stopping. And it was continuous and continuous for hours and hours and hours. And so many trucks and so many people. And as I said, we haven't seen that kind of excitement and activity in <laughs> Avondale before. <laughs> now, we have a lot of people stopping to use the washroom facilities because they've been hung up for so long in traffic. And they, they finally, they see a place and it's like, oh, we have to, we have to use the washroom. Yeah, and so, probably the coffee doesn't hurt too. And it doesn't hurt too. And, and some people, yes, they are frustrated because of the long waits, but it's a necessary evil. So the 80 meter long culvert is now in the ground and as you can see there's plenty of activity over there right now. Crews are filling it all in. Transportation and Works Minister Steve Crocker says crews made a lot of progress overnight. So we had uh, 100 workers actually work, uh, uh, well 50 on each shift uh, this weekend, 12 hour shifts. So over 100 men and women uh, actually worked around the clock this weekend to get us back to where we are. And I apologize to motors and residents of the town that are on these routes. Uh, it was a congested weekend, but at the end of the day, you know, this is a project that could have taken four to six weeks with continual delay for commuters. So, you know, uh, I guess it was a it was a short term pain, but what would be a long term gain if uh, if we had to reduce the highway for four to six weeks. This is going to remain a construction zone for the next eight to 10 days. Guardrail has to be replaced. Median repairs will have to be made. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be a construction slowdown for uh, for the next 10 days or so, which will be a 50 kilometer zone. But he says work is still on schedule. A single lane of the eastbound portion of the highway should be open by 6.30 tomorrow morning with the westbound lane opening in the afternoon. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, on the TCH near Avondale. I actually got caught up in that uh, construction. It wasn't that bad. It was half an hour going west, more like an hour coming back. But just sort of here and there, just... Take be zen. Yeah. Be very zen about it. Now, before we get to the weather, uh, we're going to try to uh, melt a few hearts out there. Yes, I absolutely love this story. Alan Doyle, the wedding crasher, but it's not totally random. Well, it turns out this couple you see there are huge fans, so much so that for 580 days straight, they tweeted Alan Doyle asking him to come play at their wedding in Prince Edward Island. Yep, hashtag Alan Doyle, please play our wedding. He's the curtain ring the bell and open the have a guitar, we'll travel. And let's check this out. They got their wish over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. He says it all. <laughs> so Doyle serenaded the happy surprise couple, even gave them a guitar, stuck around for photos. <laughs> what a memory. Yeah. Alan Doyle's playing my wife! <laughs> <laughs> How sweet. Wow. That is definitely a moment they will never forget. There they go. That's great. That's fantastic. Way to go. Well, everyone's <laughs> in tears, right? Got their wish. And there they there are. You go. That's a nice picture. So great. Anyway, hmm. Very well done, Mr. Doyle. Mm -hmm. Of course, he's probably going to get buried in requests now. <laughs> Wait, well, you played their wedding. 580, is that what they said? Yeah. 580 yeah. days? Yeah, anyhow. Nice yeah. story. Very nice story. It's beautiful here today. Gorgeous yeah. day today. We had a lovely weekend too. Temperatures uh, quite mild, especially once we got to uh, Sunday. Let's take a yeah. look at what we reached today across the province. 17 degrees in St. John's, 19 in Gander. Staying a little bit chilly up through Labrador, though. So only sitting in the single digits. 
uh, eight degrees in Maine, nine for Lab City today. Now those temperatures just dipped a little bit, sitting around 15 degrees for St. John's, 14 in Corner Brook, and still sitting in those single digits up through uh, uh, Labrador as well. Makovic currently sitting at five degrees. Now uh, we can thank a northerly wind that is going to drop the temperatures quite significantly as we head through the next couple of, uh, at least through the overnight really. Uh, you can see Twilling Gates already seeing some stronger northerly winds uh, still in that southeasterly flow for uh, the Avalon and then same for uh, the Beeren Peninsula, that southwesterly flow. So once that low pressure system moves off, we are going to see some rain with it as well. So you can see some showers moving around northerly here uh, along the northeast coast and then that southerly flow down through the southern half of the Avalon. So we're going to see those showers continue to track a little bit further uh, east and heavy at times as well uh, for parts of the Avalon and eastern Newfoundland as well as the Beeren Peninsula overnight tonight. You're going to see that chance of showers for the southeast coast as well as the northern peninsula by the time the early morning rolls around and with this rain we could see uh, upwards of about 10 to 15 millimeters and some of that heavier rain but temperatures overall sitting in those single digits again those winds will pick up and shift to northerly uh, 20 to 30 kilometers per hour six uh, degrees is the overnight low for corner brook with again that chance of showers those northeasterlies 20 to 30 kilometers per hour and then uh, St. Anthony sitting at seven degrees tonight. Up through Labrador, uh, gonna see that northerly flow as well. Those temperatures sitting between three and five degrees along the coast. Uh, pretty nice evening actually in store, otherwise just chilly for Nain at three degrees. Lab City sitting at one tonight with that chance of showers. And eventually you're gonna see some clearing as we head towards the morning hours. So here's a look at uh, the rainfall expected through Tuesday morning. Uh, heaviest rain again, south coast, potentially eastern Newfoundland or eastern Newfoundland and the Avalon as well could pick up uh, again somewhere between 10 to maybe 15 millimeters of rain and then more rain will move in uh, for the southeastern portion of Labrador as well through the day tomorrow. So you're looking at about 10 to 20 as much as 30 millimeters in some of that heavier rain and there it is there as we start to get that onshore flow again. Most of the afternoon tomorrow once we get those showers out of the way shouldn't be too bad. Uh, just some drizzle possible along the northeast coast and then that more rain moves in again. Tuesday night into Wednesday. So there's that drop in temperatures, as I mentioned, 10 to 12 degrees across the board. Those winds picking up upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. That's across the board. 11 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor and uh, similar temperatures. Best chance of seeing that sun will be along the south coast at some point tomorrow afternoon. Uh, nine degrees for St. Anthony, six for Cartwright. So you're going to stay in those single digits. The rest of Labrador, though, should clear out nicely. Lab City hitting a uh, high near 11 degrees and Happy Valley Goose Bay at nine. So we're going to see these cool temperatures stick around. But as we head towards the weekend, a little bit of a warm up. We'll have all those details coming up. Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. Pride Week kicked off in Corner Brook this morning with a flag raising at City Hall. Five flags in total have been raised around the city, and there's a bunch of activities in the lineup from an inclusive church service to trivia, karaoke, and a queer prom. Organizers say they took extra steps to ensure that there are events for people of all ages, and they've also gotten a lot of support in Corner Brook, but that's not the case everywhere you go. I think that in comparison to some other surrounding towns and cities. Um, Stephenville is very close to us in terms of like what we do for Pride Week. Um, we're very connected, we work on a lot of things together, but there's also communities like, I won't name them, but there's communities that won't even raise a Pride flag. Will they stay or will they go? Last minute negotiations happening right now to keep the Newfoundland Growlers at mile one. But can the team bridge the gap with the city in time? The details coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Will the Newfoundland Growlers stay in Newfoundland? Well, that's the question that has hockey fans holding their breath tonight as the team tries to reach a last-minute deal with the city of St. John's. Here now is Zach Gowdy with an update. Right now, officials from the city of St. John's and the Newfoundland Growlers are sitting across the table from each other trying to work out a deal to keep this team in this city. Now these are last minute negotiations. Right now they do not have an agreement to keep the Growlers at mile one beyond next season and the team's management has said it may move this team somewhere else. But late this afternoon some potential signs of hope. Mayor Danny Breen was scheduled to give a press update on the state of the negotiations but that update was abruptly cancelled. At the same time the Growlers and the St. John's Edge cancelled their own planned press event for tomorrow morning. Taken together it's a likely sign that things are happening at the negotiating table. On the ice, the Growlers' first season was a huge success, but financially, the team had a losing record. But they're doing an awful good job of trying to drive us away. But the Growlers' owner says a bad deal with the city is partly to blame. A play to buy Mile One and the St. John's Convention Center fell flat, leaving the Growlers and the St. John's Edge to work out separate lease agreements. But the numbers add up differently for these two teams. The Edge have higher paid attendance, and it's a lot cheaper to run a basketball team than a hockey team. The Growlers need more help. In late August, owner Dean McDonald tweeted a picture of himself and Growlers exec Glenn Stanford touring an arena under construction in Trois-Rivières, Quebec, a not-so-subtle hint that the Growlers are considering a move. The city of St. John says it has sweetened its offer to the team and the Growlers' championship win should put more fans in the stands at mile one. But if the two sides can't get a deal in the short term, chances of long-term success could be shut out. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, staying with hockey, some members of the Toronto Maple Leafs headed to the hospital instead of the ice this afternoon. A handful of players were at the Janeway in St. John's to brighten the day of young hockey fans. Stars such as Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, they spent some time mingling with families before heading to the wards for some room visits. The team is in St. John's for tomorrow night's big preseason NHL game against the Ottawa Senators. Jenga. All right, now for something different for you. Richard Driscoll is a poet who draws inspiration from real life. And for him, in 2017, that was prison. Today, he's living on the outside and thriving, and he's grateful for the pen. No, not the penitentiary pen, but a newsletter called The Pen, which is written by inmates for inmates. Now, you can read more about this story on our website, cbc.ca slash nl. But here's Richard Driscoll with an original poem. It's called The Boathouse. The Boathouse. What a treat to look out and stare at free people gathered round without a care. The Boathouse is the place where victory is cheered. Do you think they wonder that we are here? Goals set and team strong, they get to it while we get fed and growl over our porch. The blood and fights, we're up all night while at the break of dawn they're rowing on. Regatta is the day for which they train. Too bad. We couldn't swap places and they take the blame. We get ready and prepare for court. The vote house is here giving her support. Victory! I have the issue of, uh, of uh, money. This province's wastewater dilemma summed up in one word. Up next, we'll hear from a mayor who says municipal leaders like him don't want to be breaking the law, but argue they've been put in that very awkward position by the federal government.
Well, Justin Trudeau is making a quick trip to our province tomorrow, and many mayors and municipalities have a question for him. Why are they criminals? According to federal legislation, they are not meeting wastewater requirements, and that puts them in violation of environmental laws. And one mayor, among many, who's very concerned about this, is Derm Corbett, the mayor of Buckins. Welcome to Here and Now. Oh, thank you, Anthony. So maybe just to start off for people who are watching, just explain this wastewater treatment controversy so people know what we're talking about. Well, uh, you know, the, the concept is quite simple, and we all agree with it. The fact of the matter is that uh, provinces across the country have been uh, dumping wastewater with, uh, you know, with toxic uh, uh, effluent into our rivers and streams, and nobody's got an issue with the fact that it's time that, uh, as Canadians, we, uh, you know, we fix it. Right, and the federal government came up with some regulations, and the clock has ticked past the deadline. Why, why is it so challenging for Newfoundland, the island of Newfoundland in particular, compared to other provinces? Well, Anthony, uh, no other province is experiencing the difficulties with this that Newfoundland is. Uh, these were regulations, I, I believe, that were, uh, you know, were adopted to, to uh, reflect the, uh, the situation in Ontario or in Quebec. But in Newfoundland, because of our geography, because of our, our social... Uh, uh, condition. Uh, we're scattered all over the place. Uh, most of our communities, a lot of our communities are communities of five or six hundred people, and uh, it's a wonderful plan, but as it is written, it will not work here. And what's the difficulty with that? Because obviously if you've got hundred, you know, more than a hundred municipalities and we're dumping stuff in the ocean, we know we shouldn't be doing that. Why is, why is it such a problem here? Well, it's a problem here because in communities of five or six hundred people, you have the issue of uh, of uh, money, uh, you know, addressing the issue. Right now, Anthony, if you go in and check on the government website, you will find that the majority of communities my size and even bigger are using every cent they have to try to provide clean drinking water. So it's, it's fine to bring in uh, legislation that says we all have to start treating wastewater, but money is a definite issue. Now, if somebody wants to put a gun to our heads and, for example, the federal government could say tomorrow, listen, we're going to cut off gas tax money. Or the province could say, well, the only thing we're going to give money for is wastewater. We, you got to spend your money on that. That's, that's an option that they have. But what you're going to find then in communities my size and even bigger is you're going to find people are going to be poisoned by, with the water that they're drinking. So you're pushed into a corner where you're being forced to do something you simply can't do. We are spending $1.5 million, it's, it's a capital works project next year, to fix uh, the uh, water and sewer on one of our main roads. Now, if somebody wants to insist that we go to jail, if we don't spend that on wastewater, so be it. Let them say it. It actually has come to that, too, in terms of people not being in compliance, right? I mean, in, in terms of the letter of the law, uh, a lot of people here are breaking it. Oh, absolutely. 90% of the communities in Newfoundland right now are breaking the, uh, the regulations, and uh, it, they are enforced by fisheries officers who will come into your town council like we're sitting in here and uh, remind your clerk and your mayor and i don't know probably your councillors too that uh, they're not in compliance and they are subject to uh, jail terms and uh, massive fines well let's Lovely hope let's hope it doesn't come quite to that just a quick final question to wrap this up so uh, prime minister trudeau justin trudeau will be here tomorrow what would you tell him about this if you could actually get uh, get him for 10 minutes uh, I would tell them that we are all environmentalists. I have five grandchildren. I want the cleanest water in the world and the best air and everything else. And so do all the other mayors and uh, councillors in small towns. Uh, however, uh, there is a plan in place now that as it has been rolled out, has been so confusing and so will conceived for Newfoundland that it simply as is, it will not work. All right, uh, Durham Corbett, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Anytime, Anthony. Well, on the federal campaign trail today, Liberal leader Justin Trudeau pledged to double federal spending on early learning and child care. The new funding will be used to create up to 250,000 new spaces for before and after school programs and lower parents' fees across the board by 10%. Now, Trudeau has also promised to work with the provinces on a national child care system. Andrew Scheer said today that a Conservative government would bring back tax credits for children's extracurricular programs.
where incredibly popular tax credits, uh, thousands of, hundreds of thousands of Canadian families appreciated the extra help with paying for uh, kids' activities. Now, Shears said the credits would be $1,000 per child for fitness, arts and learning programs and $500 for educational activities outside of school. And there is also an additional $500 per year for parents of children who have disabilities. The Conservative leader says reinstating the tax credit is part of his plan to make life more affordable for Canadians. Jagmeet Singh touted the NDP's platform while introducing a high-profile new candidate today who used to lead Quebec's Green Party. We are recruiting the, some of the top environmental leaders in the province of Quebec. And they are coming to the New Democratic Party. Uh, Eric Ferland, who was once the leader of the Provincial Green Party, who recognizes that our plan is the best environmental plan. Now Singh said the NDP agrees with the Green Party about the urgency of climate change. He's also promising to give more powers to the province on issues such as the environment, language and immigration. Well, universal child care and drug programs are part of the platform unveiled today by Green Party leader Elizabeth May. She says the country has everything it needs to tackle its problems except vision. It's really hard to solve a jigsaw puzzle, even when all the pieces are there, everything you need is there, until, until you have the top of the box. May is promising to tell Canadians what her platform will be and how much it'll cost. She expects to be ready to do that within a week. For the love of the North, he is from Makovic and he is from the Northern Peninsula both mesmerized by Nunavut and they share their Arctic passion in their pictures. That's a great shot. Coming soon on Here and Now. Great day today. Pedaled the bike to work for a change. It was yes. fantastic cycling conditions, but tomorrow, yeah. not such a great cycling 
no. day. Not as far as those temperatures go. Right. Uh, we're definitely going to see a cool down as we get into this northerly flow. We'll take a look at that uh, forecast one more time. You can see barely reaching the double digits for most of us tomorrow. Uh, those winds will be brisk as well from the north northwest or northwest through the day. Uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Again, that chance of drizzle and fog more than likely along the uh, northeast coast. The chance of showers will eventually uh, end in the morning for most of the west coast anyway. The best chance of seeing that sun will be along the south coast. Port of Basque sitting around 11 degrees. Southeastern Labrador is going to continue to see that rain and cooler temperatures as well. Makovic 4 degrees. Otherwise, the sun should come out through the day. Uh, still looking at those northerly winds, though, anywhere from 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. Lab City sitting at 11 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Now here's a look at that rain. Uh, this is tomorrow night. It will eventually move uh, in again through the day on Wednesday. So it's going to be another rainy day with that north uh, northerly flow. So this is an area of low pressure. We've got a ridge of high pressure uh, just to the west and that's what's keeping uh, that northerly flow. So we're going to continue to see that through the day on Wednesday. Eventually we will start to see some clearing and you can see as this ridge moves in, those winds will shift westerly and it should clear out for most of the island. Northern Peninsula likely staying into some of that cloud cover. Same with southeastern Labrador. Otherwise, high pressure dominates and uh, with that we should see some warmer air move in along with that as well. So first, uh, going to continue to see those cooler temperatures right through Wednesday back into the single digits for parts of central corner broke 10 degrees. Plenty of sunshine as we get into that ridge of high pressure as well for Lab City 14 degrees 12 for Nain Cartwright sitting at 9 degrees for Wednesday. But again, here's that cool down we're seeing right now. If we take a look at what's going to happen as we head towards the weekend. That warmer air moves in and then again for the rest of the weekend, even more of a push of warm air will move in. So certainly once we get through these cooler temperatures, we will be in the clear as far as those warm temperatures come. So here we go as far as the next five days goes. Uh, 13 degrees by Thursday, Friday up to 19. And then that chance of showers will move in, again, move in again on Saturday. Slight chance though at this point, 17 degrees will be the afternoon high for Saturday. Central Newfoundland, there's that warm up as we head towards the weekend. Looks like 20 degree temperatures are a good bet. Might even see some humidity with that as well. And then for Western Newfoundland, essentially the same forecast. 19 degrees by Friday, a little bit of a dip for Saturday as uh, the ridge edges a little bit further east. And then overnight lows dipping down into the single digits by the weekend. Eastern Labrador, look at you, 22 degrees as well. Friday, 23, but your overnight lows are going to dip into Saturday night, 15 degrees. And then uh, same thing for Western Labrador. Plenty of sunshine. Best chance of showers will be for Friday and you'll sit around 15 degrees by then. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. An undercover CBC News investigation has found that Atlantic Canada is a hot spot for immigration fraud. Companies charge would be immigrants, many believed to be coming from China. They charge them thousands of dollars for fake job offers. And in exchange, they're promised a golden ticket of permanent residency. Angela McIver has the details from Halifax. For several weeks, the CBC posed as a couple from China looking to relocate to Canada, using the social media site WeChat to talk to an immigration company. One Honda Immigration Service said multiple times that Atlantic Canada was the best option. Eventually, they outlined how their plan and illegal scheme works. People looking to immigrate to Canada, mostly from Asia, pay as much as $180,000 to a business for a job offer. Oftentimes they move here and work for free. Sometimes they don't work at all. CBC News learned the business gets most of the money, while unlicensed consulting agencies take a cut as well. The immigrants are then guaranteed permanent residency within six months. Um, and that's really tempting for a lot of people who are from afar, who've never set foot into Canada before, and even for international graduates who, you know, it's challenging to find a job here. So if, if I can get a job offer, um, and I'm in, I, 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 I bet a lot of people would take the bid. During the investigation, CBC was offered a job for $170,000 at a daycare in Bedford, Nova Scotia. The daycare owners denied any involvement and said they've never heard of the immigration company. When CBC revealed to Juan Honda it had been in fact communicating with a journalist, the company said everything was a lie. 
The details come as no surprise to licensed immigration consultant Erica Stanley. So just the volume of phone calls is ridiculous. Stanley says in the last two years, her profession has become overrun with fraud. People ask her to forge documents and find them fake jobs. And they're like, well, we're willing to pay. I said, oh, I'm sure you are, but it's illegal to do that. Fraudsters are targeting the Atlantic Immigration Pilot Program. It's a federal program monitored by all four provincial governments. It differs from other immigration channels because some language and education requirements are lower. It also fast tracks permanent residency. Just as you cannot have a screen door on a submarine, you can't have Atlantic Canada, which has uh, in the low thousands of cases a year, to serve as a backdoor uh, to Canada's immigration program illicitly. Uh, we have to plug the leak. In a written statement, Immigration Canada said the Atlantic immigration pilot is subject to rigorous checks and balances. Angela McIver, CBC News, Halifax. Well, while the election campaign is underway, party leaders represent only their particular party, but the Prime Minister still has the job of leading the country. And today, Justin Trudeau was asked about the still murky details of last week's troubling arrest of a senior intelligence official with the RCMP. I think people will understand that I can't make any public comments on this, but uh, I can assure you that uh, this is something that we are, uh, that are the uh, responsible authorities are engaged with uh, at the highest levels, including with our allies. 47-year-old Cameron Ortis was the Director General of the RCMP's National Intelligence Coordination Centre. He had access to classified information from Canada's allies, and that includes intelligence-sharing partners in the Five Eyes Alliance. That includes the U.S., U.K., Australia and New Zealand. Ortis faces multiple charges related to trying to disclose secret information to a foreign agency or a terrorist group. RCMP Commissioner Brenda Lucky says the force has been shaken by the arrest and is working to mitigate any possible threats. Multiple government departments are also conducting their own damage assessments. Well, Britain's embattled Prime Minister met with the European Union leaders today. Boris Johnson wanted to talk about a Brexit deal, but all he managed to do was highlight the serious differences that remain. Protesters even forced him to abruptly back out of a news conference. Cameron McIntosh has more. Meeting to find common ground on Brexit, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson started his day in Luxembourg, all smiles with the European Commission President. Wow, well, we're, we're cautious, cautious. Yeah. Cautious, yeah. European Commission. Thank you. While protesters outside, many British expats were making their views known. Boris, come here, you lying scumbag! Hostilities felt throughout the day after meeting Luxembourg Prime Minister Xavier Bettel. Johnson left to a course of boos. The British Prime Minister skipping out on a joint press conference to avoid a hostile crowd. Bettle spoke next to Johnson's empty podium, clearly frustrated. It's on Mr. Johnson. He holds the future of all UK citizens. Chastising Johnson and other UK leaders for making petty politics of Brexit, which will have implications across Europe. You can't hold a future hostage for party political gains. The critical issue here is still the border with the Republic of Ireland, the backstop, a requirement for the UK to follow the EU's custom standards to avoid setting up checkpoints. Johnson is trying to revise it. EU leaders say the British Prime Minister is offering few workable ideas. Johnson insists there's still time. We've got to manage this carefully. Yes, there is a good chance of a deal. Yes, I can see the shape of it. Uh, Everybody can see roughly what could be done. Now, one thing Johnson and the EU do agree on, there's no sense in further delays, with both sides saying October 31st is a firm deadline to either get a deal or split up without one, as anxiety builds on both sides of the channel. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. Well, we want to know where you're to. Kathy Savory sent us this photo of the Harvest Moon this weekend. I'll tell you where this was taken when we come back.
Welcome back to here now. A pretty cool European story. Archaeologists in Denmark have rebuilt the Viking Bridge using only the tools that the fabled warriors would have used uh, about a thousand years ago. Yeah, and as you can imagine, this labor of love took a little longer than normal. This bridge is amazing because it has provided us with unique knowledge about how the Vikings constructed bridges and roads. A thousand people volunteered to dig holes, carve poles, and piece together the short bridge. It's only 700 meters long, but this took three years <laughs> to complete. Look at the axe. I wow. wonder why it took three yeah, years. I know. It's an actual genuine recreation of a famous route that Viking King Harold Bluetooth, little did he know, uh, <laughs> he built to move soldiers across the valley. It was wireless a thousand years ago. So um, there you go. Yep. It's a preserved Viking village museum and cemetery, and the workers admit they did have to pull up the chainsaws, but only a little bit of the time. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> Very handy. I'd say. Yeah, a yeah. lot of work too. Yes, yep. absolutely. Take a look at that photo again. Look how beautiful it is. Looks a little eerie Gorgeous actually, moon. but uh, that is the harvest moon there that we saw this weekend, and it was taken in Rose Blanche. Ah, uh, beautiful Rose Blanche. Yes, so That looks close. like a good Halloween picture. It does, doesn't it? I mean, we are getting closer and closer to October. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much to Kathy Savory for sending us that wonderful photo. And if you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Yep. Beautiful shot. And remember, if you're driving across the province in Avondale, east-west, you've got that construction, but only for the next day and then seven or eight days down to one lane. But uh, today's the last day of the big rerouting. So yeah. just take a deep breath if you're going through there. That's right. You'll make take it. Take your time. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> have a great night. Good night.